free to talk to our kids. You know, my parents were willing to take the time to read books to my sister and I and to help us understand the ins and the outs of this beautiful act. But look, (laughs) even in my use of this word, beautiful, in relation to sex, it might have some of you crawling in your skin. This is a sign that there's work to do, but I invite you to explore that. Let's not forget that this inner work is so good. Jesus will meet you there. It will lead you to so many blessings as you stretch and you grow. You shake off old patterns and thoughts and actions like we discussed last week and we move into who Christ is calling us to be. So to start with, what is this going to take? What is talking to your kids about sex, our bodies, and marriage going to require of you? Vulnerability. To explore for yourself what is going on for you in the inside. Vulnerability to admit to your kids that you don't really even know how to talk to them, but you want to. Vulnerability to tread these new waters together and have them maybe be a bit messy. But I promise you, it's all okay. We are all vulnerable creatures. We're made the same, but those who have been hurt, (laughs) i.e. all of us, We've become so used to this mechanism of building walls and hiding. That's something that the first humans on earth did, and it's something I did yesterday. You aren't alone if you feel this way sometimes too. Shame and pain both cause this type of reaction in us. And although it's common, we don't have to stay there. I'm continually learning about this, and I invite you on the journey with me. Trusting the Lord to protect our hearts and our minds as we seek to be honest about who we are and where we're at. Brene Brown defines vulnerability as daring to show up and let ourselves be seen, despite the fact that this puts you and I at the risk for being wounded. Dr. Kurt Thompson, maybe you've heard his name before in conjunction with Jenny Allen, he writes that to be human is to be vulnerable. We don't have a choice, we all have emotions and feelings. And God gave them to us as sources of information in relating to him and to others. In possessing these emotions and feelings, we too run the risk of experiencing negative emotions and hurt from others. But we also have a choice regarding how we deal with these emotions. We may employ numerous techniques for avoiding the pain of negative emotions, such as numbing out, blaming others, blaming ourselves, etc., Regardless of whatever technique we use, underneath it all, the original emotion is still there. Thompson explains in his book, The Soul of Shame, that it comes down to this question, not if we are or will be vulnerable, but rather how and when will we enter into it, consciously and intentionally, for the sake of creating a world of goodness and beauty. Uh, my mind is blown. So he's saying that we would intentionally and consciously move into vulnerability, like on purpose, (laughs) for the sake of creating a world of goodness and beauty around us. So it's going to take vulnerability on your behalf to help your children create a world of goodness and beauty as best as you can regarding sex. Are you in? Uh, If you're like me at the beginning, you'll be really hesitant, but that's okay. I want you to think of this though. The question that I often ask my clients is at what cost? At what cost are you choosing to avoid this hard topic? I realize and have lived the truth that we simply cannot give what we don't have. So maybe you're feeling ill-equipped. Well, that's my desire today, to equip you, to further your journey maybe, to build the foundations of why we should talk about sex with our children and how. Throughout these podcasts, you'll hear me reference many different people, as I certainly don't walk this road alone. John Piper is a well-known theologian and pastor who has much to say on this topic. Robbie Simons is the pastor of Hope Church in Oakville here in Ontario, He gave the sermon series on Imago Day that I've mentioned before, and I'll reference it here again. I've studied under Bethany Robbins, a counselor at the Allender Center in Seattle, 
And most recently, I love what Hilary Morgan Farrar has to say about all of this as well. This research over the years has led me to a deep belief in strict male and female only sexuality. Even though all of those people say this, all of it is based on the foundational truths of scripture alone, which we will get into. Our kids need to see us partner with Holy Spirit in all the areas of our life and perhaps especially in this area. Our kids also need to see us continually learning and growing while being deeply rooted in scripture In a world that is so topsy-turvy where men want to become women and there are no longer only two genders according to the world's standards, we always have to go back to God's original design. Remember when I said that I hold extreme personal views on things like this in the first episode of the series? Well, here we go. Sexuality is one of the ways that God reveals himself to us. When we think about things like marriage, sex, our bodies, and gender, we have to ask, what do they point to? We have to understand that they are actually an idea from outside of ourselves. We have to understand the original design started with God, and from this flows our purpose, our meaning. Oh man, and when we get sexuality wrong, we actually start to distort our ability to understand who God is. Let's turn to near the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1, verse 27. This lays the foundation for understanding genders and God's will for us. It all comes down to this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. When you take a look at Genesis 1.27, we see that God made us not just male and female, but male and female in his image. We are image bearers of the creator of the whole entire universe, the living God. This is where we get our worth and our dignity and our purpose from. In Genesis 1.31, God goes ahead and looks at all that he has made and he declared it very good. Doesn't that excite you? So when we think about talking to our kids about sex, we have to start here. You see, when I was chatting about story in the last episode and the importance of changing our neurons, yes, it's important work, but that isn't actually the be-all and the end-all. We are more than just neurons. We are image bearers. We reflect something of God's nature and character to the rest of creation, In Genesis 1, the Lord says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Verse 26. The Gospel Coalition article recounts it like this, that God suddenly stops the unfolding of the creation account. Remember, like he's doing plants and animals and the light and the day and the night and the stars and the moon, and he stops that. And he invites us in. And he tells us what he's about to do. He's about to create mankind. Not only that, he tells us why he's going to place his image on this earth and he's going to do it in the form of men and women, just like we read in verse 27. Our purpose as children of God, as men and women, is to bear his image. Okay, so now we got to take a look at like what are images? Why is that so important? Images are representations, or as good old Google says, general impressions that a person presents to the public. We are designed to be reflections of God here on this earth. Hebrews 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are created to be ambassadors for him, pointing others to him. We are mirrors displaying his character to the world. When people see us, they see aspects of God. And men and women each show different things. How cool is that? Your purpose then isn't something that you earn or work for. It's something you already are. The design of God is the will of God. Okay, so an associate professor of Christian ethics and apologetics at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary named Andrew Walker. So that's a smart guy who works at a college our seminary says this. He has actually an exposition, which is like a comprehensive description and explanation of Genesis chapter one and chapter two. 
Maybe you want to get a pen and piece of paper if you don't already have it, because what he's going to do is lay out the basics of what we believe as Christians, biblically speaking. And it also gives us an outline for kind of where to start with our kids. It's one thing to tell them about the act of sex and about our body parts, but it's another to teach them the truth of who they are and why God made us this way, just like I already mentioned. The brain has a hard time distinguishing between what is true and what is simply familiar. So the more times something is repeated, even if it isn't true, the more times we are willing to believe it. Just take a look at the world around us. Hey, like the messaging that is so, so prevalent and being pushed on our kids right now. So we have to make sure that our kids are familiar with the truth. And that is what is going to set the stage for proper and biblical thinking. So Andrew goes on to say, number one, we clearly see from these verses in Genesis 1 and 2 that God created. God is the source of all creation. And as a believer, we must start there. Okay, so God created. Number two, God created humanity. We don't self-create. You see, when we start to take ourselves out from underneath God's authority and out from underneath the way that he designed it, we decide that we don't need God. If we believe we can self-create, then we no longer need his authority over us. His order in the world and design for our lives then becomes null and void. God made sex to reveal something to us about himself. It's outside of ourselves. There's safety within the confines of how we are created. To create then our own sexual preferences also sets us up to believe that we are without accountability because therefore, if we don't have God's accountability, we are now the ones who can determine what is right and wrong. That is a mighty dangerous place to be. So again, God created, then God created humanity. Then number three, God created humanity in his image. Our sexual design is a massive part of our dignity and we cannot separate Imago Dei from male and female, who equally, we each bear the image of God. The Hebrew word for this image is called salam, 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 which means something that is carved out or cut out. John Calvin explains it this way, that man resembles him and that in him, God's glory is contemplated as in a mirror. Number four, God created humanity. Now we add male and female. God created humanity, male and female. We are not a made up product of psychology, but we are fixed bodily realities. When we die, there will be a certain amount of chromosomes for us who are male or female, regardless of our sexual preference while we're living. Did you know that a female has 74 trillion X chromosomes? And guess how many Y chromosomes she has? Mm -hmm. Zero. Nothing on earth will change that. Chromosomes are in the cells that make up our bodies. There are only two genders. We'll get to number five in a minute, but I hear so often that people are afraid of teaching about sex too early for various reasons that we'll discuss next week. But this is one of the biggest mistakes you can think of, my friends. God has given these kids to us for us to teach and disciple. We need to be the experts on this subject, and a way to introduce sex super early is to first teach about identity from an early age, even as early as two and three. Call them over to the couch and say, okay, kiddos, today we're going to key in on something so, so special. You know, kids love to sing and to dance and to do actions and to move their bodies. So we can utilize that and say the Bible says that God created us in his image. He created males and females. What are you? They'll jump up and say a boy. They'll jump up and say a girl. Okay, on the count of three, jump up and wave your hands like crazy if you're created in God's image and you're a boy and you're a girl. Wahoo! Now, let's see who else can we think of that's a boy or a girl that's created in God's image too. So even by doing something as simple as this, we're already starting to instill a positive biblical view, even at that age. Okay, so carrying on with the last point that Andrew Walker makes, number five, we see later on in Genesis chapter two, that God created male and female for one another. This is the relationship of marriage in the design of God for sexual intimacy. 
The Godhead is three persons in perfect union with one another. And we are created for community and intimacy in relationship, becoming one flesh, as Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 and 24 puts it. You know, we might think that it's old-fashioned or prudish to think that we must follow this one design for success in our life or even in our society. But in the 1930s, there was a man by the name of J.D. Unwin, and he studied over 80 different civilizations on the role of sexuality and morality. He was not a believer, and yet he came to the astounding result that any civilization that held to a strict sexual morality, meaning male and female, they flourished. And every other civilization that decided they wanted to go astray from that They died. They physically died. Their energy, their cohesion as a society, and their purpose dwindled, and they went extinct. (laughs) What does our world look like right now? Is our cohesion intact? No, people have lost their purpose. They've lost their way. They're walking around so confused. You can read about J.D. Unwin's article on a blog. It's called Sex and Culture. Here's the thing. What happens when more than just one person chooses to do this? When a whole culture follows in this way, it becomes literally cultural insanity, just like we're seeing. Psalm 11.3 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, what we can do right now is to A, understand how God designed us, and B, have a hold firm to him who knows us, who loves us, and wants the best for us. We need to abide by our God-given design, and to teach our children to do the same. There are so many biblical grounds for believing that blessing comes when we obey the Lord and follow his ways. By understanding how and why God made us, the guardrails for sexuality start to be implemented, and there's safety in that. A way to start talking to your kids about this portion of it, of like the safety and why it's important, again, is pretty simple. It's about the why. We need to help our kids learn that sex and our bodies and our marriage are all things to be safeguarded because of how precious they are and what they point to. Hilary Farrar gives these examples. When we go to an art museum, why do they have art behind the glass? Well, to protect it, of course. But what about nuclear weapons? Do they simply have glass around them? (laughs) No, of course not. They're super powerful, and if messed with in the wrong way, they can be super duper destructive. So we have to put the maximum safeguards around it. Just like nuclear weapons, we need to safeguard the truth about sex, our bodies, and marriage. We as humans have inherent worth and sex has great spiritual significance. When those things get tampered with, there are deep consequences. After testing what I say against scripture, which I always suggest that you do, search for yourself where you stand with all of this. And let's move into more deep questions about your own sexual story. Like I said before, as you move into conversations with your kids, what you've experienced and what you believe will be mirrored to them. If you are free, you feel no shame and you tend to be curious about your story, you might not have any issues. But for most of us, we have to start to explore a little. You can feel free to write as I speak, but I've also linked a free PDF that outlines all of these questions in the show notes. So when was the first time that I learned about what sex was? Who was that with? How did it make me feel? Do I believe what the Bible says about male and female only sexuality? On what grounds do those stand? When was the first time I felt aroused? What did I do with that? Is wanting to think myself pretty a negative thing? Is wanting to be attractive to others good, bad, dangerous? How do I feel about my own body? Is sex bad? Where did I learn about how a woman should act or look? Do I need to look a certain way in order to be pleasurable or wanted? Is sex my duty to my spouse? If so, who taught that to me? Is that good, bad, biblical? God says everything about how he has made me is good. Do I really believe that? What am I mad at God for in regards to sex, my body, or my marriage? Friends, don't forget that God's intent was that we were made with dignity and value. Well, what ways do you feel valued during sex? In what ways are you able to honor your spouse during sex? Is sex simply about the act? Where does intimacy come in? What feels intimate to me? 
How do I feel loved? Am I able to openly speak about my needs to my partner? If not, why? If sex was given to us as a gift to enjoy, what needs to change in order for me to think like that? Oh my goodness, so many questions. And guess what? This is the perfect time for you to be delving into this. You aren't here by accident. And as you wrestle with and engage these questions, I firmly believe that your foundation for teaching your kids about all of this will be strengthened, especially as we bring it back to the Bible. Are we willing to be vulnerable consciously and intentionally for the sake of creating a world of goodness and beauty for our kids? All this work is to the glory and honor of Jesus. May he use us as he sees fit and may he go before us as we seek to align ourselves with the truth of who he is and how he has made us. Praying for you, friends. Have a great week.